Steve asked me to talk about some big ideas, be sort of ambitious in the speech, so uh, I did so uh, to excess, probably. It's probably the most immodest uh, title I've ever uh, spoken under. Uh, the one I actually have on my sheet, uh, I, I hesitate to read it to you. It says, the waning of materialism, the future of Western civilization. So, so that's what I'm going I'm to talk about. Um, now, the great uh, Danish physicist Niels Bohr, you may have heard this one, said the prediction is very difficult, especially about the future. And uh, I agree. So uh, I should make this clear at the beginning, I'm not really predicting the future of Western civilization here. Uh, what I'm doing is a kind of extrapolation, which of course is also dangerous. I want to reflect on our present moment in intellectual history, look at uh, what I see as a mounting heap of evidence and argument against a materialist philosophy, and then speculate a little bit about what, that might, what might succeed it, and what sort of implications that might have uh, for our civilization. So again, big questions. Uh, Western civilization, I think, me. one of the things that's uh, quite unique about it is the fact that it's characterized by these recurring debates and controversies which are never really fully resolved. Uh, here's some examples, right? Individual autonomy versus social cohesion, nature versus nurture, free will versus fate, faith versus reason, and so on. So I want to focus today on, on one such debate concerning the ultimate nature of reality. The debate of materialism versus the various anti-materialist philosophies like idealism, dualism, and I'm going to include Aristotelianism, Aristotle's philosophy in there as well. So I'm going to talk about four big things here, four parts. First of all, I'm going to define materialism. Philosophers always have to do that before they get started. Uh, secondly, I'm going to discuss very briefly six major challenges that I see to materialist philosophy in the modern world. Uh, thirdly, I'll discuss uh, what I think is likely to succeed materialism if it does indeed wane. And then finally, I'll talk for just a couple minutes about what sort of effects that might have on political theory and practice and culture. Uh, and I'm going to argue it's gonna, it, if that does happen, it will, the result will be the replacement of both right and left wing liberalism as we know it today by a more local, decentralized, communal, hierarchical, religious, and traditional sort of society. All right, so number one, uh, defining materialism. Uh, materialism is one of the oldest forms of Western philosophy. It begins with the pre-Socratic philosophers of the school of Miletus on the, on the coast of Turkey, especially Thales and others, who sought to understand the world in terms of its ultimate constituents, water, air, or whatever. Uh, this materialist uh, tradition is carried on by Empedocles, who gave us the, the idea of the four elements, earth, air, water, uh, air, and fire, and also a pre-Darwinian theory of evolution by natural selection and also by Democritus with his early atomic theory and his attempt to reduce mind and experience to the motions of atoms in the void. Now, materialism was also actually quite popular in the, in the Roman period, uh, the, uh, embodied by the Epicurean school of thought. And there's the uh, poet Lucretius, whose uh, famous uh, poem, Rerum Novarum, was a kind of manifesto for materialist thought. And that was revived in the 17th century by Galileo in Italy and Gassendi in France, Thomas Hobbes, Francis Bacon in England, taken up in the 18th century by the French, so it sort of moves around geographically, uh, especially the uh, film of philosophs and encyclopedists, uh, Diderot, Lebetre. Early 19th century, it uh, finds its home among the physiologists in Germany, uh, Buchner and Vogt, and then they in turn influenced Feuerbach, Marx, Nietzsche, and then of course Charles Darwin's theory of evolution uh, gave a new impetus to materialist thought throughout the Western world. Between Nietzsche and Marx on the one hand, and the physicalism of some of the later logical <coughs> empiricists, like Tarski and others, uh, materialism in various forms came to dominate philosophy in the 20th century, both in its English-speaking and in its continental varieties. <coughs> some materialists lean to the left, including uh, Marxism, and others uh, lean to the right, including uh, social Darwinists and some sociobiologists. But all were united in the elevation of a certain kind of physical science to the pinnacle of uh, human thought. Indeed, it's been um, two scientific developments of the last 300 years that made materialism seem credible, even inevitable to many people. The incredible success and fantastic simplicity of the Newton-Maxwell theory of classical physics in the late 19th century, and then the great strides that were made in understanding living things in biochemical terms, from the synthesis of urea in 1828 to the discovery of DNA in, in 1953. Uh, to these two discoveries, too, I think we have to add the computer revolution of uh, the 20th century, which gave great hope that a purely mechanical model of reason, intelligence, and choice might be, uh, might be possible. Now, can we find any common threads that unite this, this, wide, this vast tradition over 2,700 years? 
In particular, I think we need to look at what divides materialists in this school from the other competing philosophies, including dualism, idealism, and, and Aristotle's view. And I think we can identify three fundamental commitments to materialism that unites everybody from Democritus and Lucretius to Karl Marx to E.O. Wilson to Stephen Weinberg. Uh, first, materialists are committed to understanding the world in quantitative terms rather than qualitative terms. They're looking for a kind of universal geometry as the foundation of reality, a world of shape, mass, and motion. The elimination of the qualitative dimension of reality is common ground between Democritus, Lucretius, Galileo, and modern materialists. Democritus said there are no qualities in the world, right? no colors, smells, or tastes. These are mere appearances produced by us <coughs> by, physical, by physical motions in our, in our brain. And of course, among the qualities that get eliminated are qualities like beauty, goodness, righteousness, and justice. Second, materialists seek to find a bottom-up rather than a top-down explanation of natural phenomena. That is, they privilege the microscopic world over the macroscopic one. Um, we, according to materialists, we can always analyze the behavior of large bodies, <coughs> including, including living bodies, in terms of the, of the motions of very small bodies. And then societies, likewise, become mere heaps of individuals, uh, and organisms nothing but heaps of fundamental particles. Everything that can be understood can be understood in terms of microphysics, the basic idea. <coughs> and thirdly, most importantly, materialists assume that these microscopic, merely quantitative, elements of reality are purposeless and unknowing. The fundamental elements of reality are uniformly brute, dumb, unfeeling, aimless, uh, merely pushed and pulled this, and way by, this and that way by forces, which are themselves <coughs> blind and purposeless. There's no built-in natural purpose or end to anything, and the only purposes that exist are merely apparent purposes to be explained in terms of natural selection. So as Richard Dawkins puts it, puts it we're merely robots <coughs> constructed by our genes for the purpose of replicating themselves, with scare quotes around, around all of those words. Um, thus, the core of materialism is a belief that the fundamental level of reality is quantitative, <coughs> microscopic, and purposeless. All forms of purpose and meaning, all the qualitative richness of human experience, must be reduced uh, to this fundamental level. It's the materialist idea. This reduction must take, the case, must take the form of postulating the existence of tremendously complex mechanisms, all assembled ultimately by a com combination of chance and natural selection. Okay, so that's the definition. Part two, some challenges to materialism in the late uh, 20th and early 21st centuries. Um, so the middle of the 20th century, 1940s and 50s, I think of that as the apogee of materialism. That's when things were really looking good for materialists. Uh, it was the heyday of the Frankfurt School of neo-Marxist philosophy, of behaviorism and psychology, physicalism and American philosophy, and the neo-Darwinian synthesis in biology. Origin of life research had gotten off to a good start, and uh, the ideas of int artificial intelligence or robotics were beginning to take hold. Since, however, about 1960, and actually a little bit earlier than that, everything began to move in the opposite direction, I argue. The last 50 years have seen the pendulum swing, and, and swing with increasing velocity as time passed. So there are a number of different uh, revolutions to mention, but I'm, again, I'm just gonna mention six, and I'm just gonna throw them out there pretty quickly. I won't be able to defend them in great detail, but I wanna give you a, a sense of the, again, this cumulative case that I see. So the six are uh, the mysteries of quantum mechanics, the irreducibility of life, the fine tuning of the universe for life, the hard problem of consciousness, the problem of intentionality in thought, and the uh, irreducibility of the normative dimension of life. So those are the, those are the six. Uh, so I'll start with the mysteries of quantum mechanics. So as you all know, in the 1920s, theoretical physics underwent a revolution. And it was really a much more profound revolution than Einstein's uh, theory of, revolution, uh, of relativity, which was really just the capstone to the uh, Newton-Maxwell picture of the world. Um, the quantum revolution reversed everything, really, that was essential to the classical model, and I think essential to the philosophy of materialism. Unlike the world of Democritus, or Lucretius, or Newton, or Maxwell, the quantum world is not one of bottom-up determination. As David Bohm has pointed out in a couple of his books, uh, The Undivided Universe and The Implicate Order, the quantum world is a fundamentally holistic or top-down world. Quantum, quantum particles are entangled in systems that are completely resistant to analytical decomposition. The whole is always greater than the sum of its parts in quantum mechanics. In addition, the theory of quantum mechanics provides no evidence whatsoever that the world is deterministic, and therefore provides us with no rational basis for thinking that the physical universe <coughs> represents a kind of closed causal network. And in addition, the quantum world is one in which the subjectivity of the, of the observer can never be left out of account. And it's a world that provides us with glimpses of many purely qualitative parameters 
So we get, instead of just talking about shape and size, we're talking about color, flavor, uh, charge, spin, and other sorts of qualities of these uh, small particles. Okay, um, there's a lot more to spin about that, but I'll move on. Uh, secondly, the irreducibility of life. So the materialist explanation has to rely on chance right, to generate all of the molecular m machines that nature, uh, that nature then can, can then select and proliferate. Without the, uh, if the mechanism isn't there, it can't be selected for, it can't proliferate. Thus, the viability of materialistic explanations of life ultimately turn on mathematical questions. Questions about the probability or improbability of the natural world's uh, enabling to complete, completing the necessary blind searches through the biological or biochemical space. Now, at first, geology seemed to be very generous in its provisions, giving us hundreds of millions of years, or maybe even a billion years to work with. Um, and so long as we thought that living things were actually fairly simple, uh, composed of, of <coughs> simple machines like levers and pumps and that sort of thing, uh, the Darwinian and Neo-Darwinian models seem sort of plausible. Uh, the Miller-Urey experiment in 1953, for instance, suggested that lightning striking a primitive ocean could generate all the chemical building blocks of life. However, we've now penetrated the cell, which uh, Michael Behe's called the Darwin's black box, something that we didn't really understand before that. And we find that it's filled with complex uh, micro, macromolecular machines. That, in fact, uh, any given cell, even of a primitive organism like a bacterium, makes, uh, well, it's, it's a very sophisticated chemical laboratory, complete with electric motors, internal postal delivery systems with barcodes, and most marvelously of all, the self-replicating DNA li library. Now, one of the first signs of impending trouble occurred in the Wistar Institute in Philadelphia in 1966, where a group of mathematicians met with a group of biologists. And the mathematicians argued that bio biologists were were radically underestimating the mathematical improbabilities involved in the chance construction of, of novel biological machines. And their proceedings actually was, came, came with this ominous title, Mathematical Challenges to the Neo-Darwinian Interpretation of, of Evolution. Uh, in 1968, the Hungarian philosopher and chemist Michael Polanyi wrote his article, Life's Irreducible Structure, which, in which he argued that the information contained in the DNA molecule is not reducible to the laws of physics and chemistry. Uh, in 1984, chemist Charles Thaxton and material scientist Walter Bradley published The Mystery <coughs> of Life's Origin, in which they pointed out that the then current state of origin of life research had made the chance formation of the first separate replicating organism far beyond the bounds of mathematical probability. In fact, it's this problem of the origin of life, which of course is a problem that has to be solved before Darwinian evolution can even get started. You have to have a replicator before you can have uh, evolution. Uh, this is what led the world's leading atheist philosopher, Anthony Flew, to abandon atheistic materialism in 2004 and to embrace some form of deism uh, with an Aristotelian sort of God. Uh, now, the biological problems with materials do not end, though, with the origin of life. A series of books have argued the subsequent uh, evolution of life on Earth exhibits a kind of inherent tendency towards functionality that can't be explained by chance or by the combination of chance with natural selection alone. And this is part of what might call, what's been called the intelligent design movement. And so, just for a uh, uh, Fair warning, I've been associated with that movement myself, uh, so I'm not an unbiased source by any means. But I might mention uh, Michael Denton's work, uh, Evolution of Theory uh, in Crisis and Nature, Nature's Purposes. I've already mentioned Michael Behe, um, William Dembski's No Free Lunch, and most recently, uh, Stephen C. Myers had a couple of very interesting books on this as well. Now, Denton Behe, uh, as I say, this ID movement has uh, received recent favorable attention by two of America's leading uh, philosophers. Alvin Plantinga at Notre Dame in uh, where, where the Conflict Really Lies, which is an excellent book on the relationship between uh, science and religion. And uh, Thomas Nagel, his book, uh, Mind and Cosmos, Nagel said. Nagel's an interesting case, again, because he's an atheist philosopher, a very prominent outspoken philosopher uh, at Princeton. And uh, Nagel, like Flew, has moved in the direction of an Aristotelian naturalism in which nature is infused with imminent purpose and design and uh, as opposed to a Darwinian sort of picture. Okay, number three, third challenge. Third challenge to materialism arises from discoveries about the origin and structure of the observable universe. So in the 1930s, a Belgian astronomer, uh, Georges Lemaitre, discovered that the equations of Einstein's theory of relativity could explain the red shift that was observed in distant galaxies by showing that the universe was, was constantly expanding. And then he made the obvious logical deduction, which is the universe is expanding at a, at a constant rate. 
then there must have been some time in the, in the past, 14, 16 million years ago or so, when the universe was infinitely dense. It was packed into a, uh, an impossibly dense uh, state, from which it emerged an event that's called the Big Bang. Uh, this Big Bang hypothesis was res resisted by Einstein and by many astronomers for a long time, as historian and astronomer Robert Jastrow documents in his book, uh, God and the Astronomers, because they were disturbed by its apparent theological implications. It sounded an awful lot like Genesis 1. Uh, God said there was light and there was light. Uh, however, the empirical evidence was steadily growing until in 1964 astronomers discovered the uh, background radio, microwave radiation, which really effectively settled the issue. So the Big Bang is itself a serious challenge to materialism, since at least it seems to point to the idea that the material universe is not uh, self-sufficient, that it can't be the ultimate explanation even of itself. But the Big Bang was only the beginning of troubles for materialism. In the 1960s, Cosmologists began to discover a whole series of coincidences, which were built into the very composition and structure at the beginning of the universe, uh, which has become, come to be described as the fine tuning of the universe for life. So in effect, what, what cosmologists did is they ran a series of thought experiments <coughs> in which you, you build a sort of universe building machine with a series of dials on one side. And by adjusting the dials, you set the, these, uh, these basic parameters of the, of the Big Bang the universe at, at its origin. So for instance, one dial might re represent the strength of uh, gravity versus electromagnetic uh, attraction. Or another dial might, might affect the uh, average density of the matter at a certain point in the Big Bang. And uh, what astronomer Brandon Carter, Fred Hoyle, and others discovered is that if these dials are not set to precisely the right values, uh, the universe, uh, one of two things happens. Either the universe never successfully evolves into a world of, of galaxies and stars. It either just immediately collapses back into a big bang, or it spreads out into a big hydrogen cloud, and there's no, there are no stars at all. Or if it does produce stars, the stars, when they, when they collapse into a supernova, they don't produce the heavy elements during that process that are needed for life, especially carbon. So, um, so it looks as though our universe had to be very carefully pre-designed for the formation of stars, planet, and carbon. Uh, the three components of, uh, that are necessary for life and consciousness as, as we know it, at least. Now again, many cosmologists resisted this conclusion for a long time. Again, I think because of the metaphysical implications of such a conclusion. It's inconsistency with materialism, ultimately. But one by one, the various alternatives have fallen away until modern materialists have really only one recourse left, which is the so-called multiverse universe. Our most popular version of this, the original Big Bang, <coughs> broke apart at a very early stage at, a, at the inflationary period into an incredibly large number of little universes, of which our observable universe is just one. Now, if there, are, if there are enough of these universes, and if they somehow varied enough in terms of their fundamental parameters, then it looks like there's some, then it seems like it's likely that at least one of these would end up fine-tuned for life. And since we couldn't uh, ask these questions if we weren't here, uh, it's not surprising, so it goes, uh, that we find our universe fine-tuned for life. Now, this multiverse hypothesis, I think, is a sign of desperation on, this, on the part of materialists. Uh, there's absolutely no independent evidence for the existence of even one of these alternate universes, much less the vast number that would be needed to make this argument work. In addition, as planning has pointed out, again, in where the conflict really lies, the multiverse hypothesis actually doesn't provide us with any explanation for why this universe in particular is fine-tuned for life, and that still seems like a problem. And thirdly, as Robin Collins has argued, He's a philosopher of physics at uh, Messiah College, and it's an excellent website on this, too, if you would like to look into it. Uh, he's argued that the, the generation of a sufficient number of universes itself requires fine-tuning. So they have to be a fine-tuning of the proto-universe in order to produce enough universes to uh, get the multiverse thing to work. So that, if that's true, then this doesn't provide any ultimate explanation, it just pushes the problem back a step. We still need some sort of design. Okay, problem four, uh, the hard problem of consciousness. Now, in the 1950s and 60s, nearly every philosopher of mind in the English-speaking world, really, had embraced some sort of materialism or, or physicalism, according to which all mental states, including thoughts, feelings, and experiences, were to be identified with brain states, that is, with the states of the fundamental particles, uh, quarks, and so on, that make up our brains. However, as we documented in, in The Waning Materialism, which uh, actually was edited by George Beeler and me in, in 2010, uh, this materialist consensus has broken down in succeeding years. Uh, the most important cause of this breakdown, I think, is what 
Australian philosopher David Chalmers has called the hard problem of consciousness. So a plausible materialist theory of consciousness must reduce conscious experience to behavioral functions. That is, the descriptions of how a conscious organism acts and reacts to its environment. However, there's always what Joseph Levine has called a conceptual gap between any such functional description of an organism and the internal conscious states of that, in, that organism. We can easily imagine, for example, a zombie, so-called. Mm -hmm. In philosophy, was, we, we mean something slightly different by zombies than, than most people do. For us, a zombie actually looks exactly like an ordinary human being and behaves exactly like an ordinary human being, but just there aren't any lights in on the inside. There's no, there's no uh, conscious experience going on inside. I guess there's actually a room here at Texas Tech called the Qualia Room, and so, uh, uh, qualia is, is, the, is the American uh, philosophical term for that, that rich inner experience of our, of our conscious lives. So I guess, uh, I guess the Qualia room somehow bans <laughs> zombies. I'm not allowed here in the night. It's a good thing to know. Um, so the hard problem for con of consciousness for the materialist is explaining how it's possible for, for a system of, of brute, unfeeling particles to be the subject of such qualitatively rich experiences. Uh, the American philosopher Saul Grippy pointed out in 1972 the, the essential incoherence of the materialist strategy for reducing or eliminating secondary qualities in the end. So again, materialists from Democritus to Galileo argue that physical bodies are not really colored, smelly and tasty and so on, but uh, that color is not really out there on the surface of things, but it's in here in the mind. But then, I mean, that's not good enough for materialism, right? So the materialist then has to try to extend this process of reduction one step further and claim that color is not only not out there, it's not in here either, right? But you can't say that our experience of colored appearances in experience is only apparent because even mere appearances are still real appearances, right? So in other words, the color has to be really somewhere, either out in the world or in our experience. You can't sort of sweep it under the rug of experience to get it out of the world, and then sweep it out of the rug as well, when I don't know where, uh, in order to deny that it's in the mind either. Okay, um, philosopher Philip Frank Jackson has produced another thought experiment that illustrates this problem, the problem of uh, Mary the color scientist. So Mary is completely colorblind from, from birth, sort of black-white vision, and uh, she's never experienced then the, she's never had the experience of, of apparently seeing something red, as we have. Um, however, she becomes an expert on every, all the biophysics of color vision, the surfaces of the earth, the frequencies of light, the way that the brain works, and all that. So, so by hypothesis in this thought experiment, she's omniscient about all the physical aspects, the behavioral functioning involved in color experience. Now, fortunately, we were able to give Mary a treatment so that, so that suddenly she has color experience for the first time. And we show her a sample of red without telling her what it is. Right? And she looks at it and she says, hmm, I wonder if that is the experience that people have when they have red experiences, right? That sort of thing. Is that the sort of thing that's, that's red experiences? We can tell her, yes, it is. Now she's actually learned something, and she's learned something, a general truth about human experience, namely that that sort of experience is the red experience, which she didn't know before. But by hypothesis, she already knew all the physical facts. So there must be some additional fact which isn't physical, isn't uh, reducible to physical, which she's now experienced. Uh, so that's number four. Uh, number five. Okay, we're almost done. The irreducibility, irreducibility of intentionality. Okay, so the fifth challenge also comes from the philosophy of mind. So four and five involve the philosophy of mind. This challenge, um, this, uh, this, is, this is the problem of intentionality. So in 19, the 19th century Austrian philosopher Franz Brentano uh, argued that intentionality is the mark of the mental. It's, it's what distinguishes the mental from the physical. So intentionality refers to the aboutness of mental states. That uh, an intentional thing is somehow about something else, something that need not be present and need not even exist. Right? So a painting of the Eiffel Tower is about the Eiffel Tower, can represent the Eiffel Tower as having a certain shape and color and so on, even if the Eiffel Tower is thousands or millions of miles away, it doesn't matter. Uh, similarly, the word apple is about apples. The word Dinosaurs, about dinosaurs, even though there aren't any anymore. The word unicorn is about unicorns, even though there aren't any unicorns at all. And likewise, the name Santa Claus is about Santa Claus. So, um, so such um, words and pictures can be used to make false or true statements, accurate and inaccurate representations. Now, the intentionality of pictures, words, and sentences 
are plausibly cases of what are called derived or dependent intentionality. That is, a picture or a word gets its intentionality because of its relationship to the human mind. We use, we create pictures, we interpret pictures, use words in various ways. So that just again pushes the problem back a step. That means that the human mind must have primitive or independent intentionality aboutness. I can think about the Eiffel Tower. I can think about dinosaurs, right? And so the question, the challenge for the materialist is to explain how a merely physical system can give rise to that kind of primitive or basic intentionality. Um, physics and chemistry have no room for intentional relations. Fundamental particles are what they are. They never involve any kind of reference to some other sort of particle or phenomena. They certainly don't have any natural connection to non-existent things like unicorns or Santa Claus. So how can merely adding together a bunch of uh, particles give rise to intentionality? Where could it possibly come from? So materialists have just found two possible uh, explanations of this problem. One involves uh, behavioral functions alone, and the other tries to combine this with, uh, with facts about human history. So let me uh, run through a couple more thought experiments for you. The next one's called the Chinese Room Experiment, uh, produced by uh, John Searle at, uh, at uh, uh, Stanford. So now we imagine that uh, we've got a Chinese student, let's call her Li, and her, her mind is full of intentionality about the world. And we're going to try and reduce that intentionality to the behavioral inputs and outputs, her linguistic behavior. Well, Searle imagines we set up a gigantic room where each person in the room corresponds to some neuron in Lee's brain or some functional part of the neuron or whatever. Right? And each person in the room has a little instruction book that tells them to what to do in response to various uh, stimuli. And they send signals to each other, we'll say by telegraph, by Morse code. Uh, it's going to get uh, old-fashioned, little retro punk kind of stuff here. So they're, they're sending uh, signals to each other by telegraph. Right? And uh, we have one, one person in this room represents uh, Lee's eyes and ears. So we give her some information through the eyes and ears, tap, 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 tap. Uh, information flows through this gigantic room, and out comes finally uh, a ch sentence in Chinese from somebody. Um, now, Cyril argues that it's obvious that the room is not thinking. The room doesn't have any intentionality, even though it perfectly duplicates uh, uh, the uh, behavioral processes of Lee. Now, what some philosophers then argued is that what's missing is the evolutionary history, right? So. Uh, Searle's Chinese room didn't evolve in the same way that you and I evolved, and that's what makes us different. That's what gives the brain the intentionality that it has. Um, so, for instance, um, what, what, what gives, when I, when I have sugar in my tongue, I have a certain kind of sweet sensation, right? What, what gives, what makes that sensation about sugar, right? Well, what makes it about sugar is that I had ancestors who, who had that sweet sensation when there was sugar on their tongue, and for some reason that association helped them to survive better. That's what, that's what gives that taste meaning for me now. It's what gives it its content. Okay. Now this too has come under criticism, and uh, for reasons of time, I'll just uh, I'll try to skip ahead to the crunch here. Uh, I want to give the, uh, a thought experiment that uh, Alex, Alexander Cruz at Baylor and I have uh, uh, been working on recently. It's called the, uh, the Great Grazing ground, ground in the Sky Thought Experiment. Okay. So we philosophers love crazy thought experiments, because what they do is they show that um, Claims about one thing constituting something else by its very nature are false. If we can come up with a plausible thought experiment that shows the two things that come apart, right? So here's the thought experiment. You've got, uh, there's Earth, this evolutionary history. On the other side of the galaxy is Bizarro Earth, where exactly the same history is repeated. So there's a Bizarro Coons over there giving a lecture to Bizarro counterparts of you. And all the evolutionary history of everybody in that room is exactly the same as you and me, right? with one slight exception, okay, which is the bizarro Earth is visited by a race of extremely benevolent and powerful aliens in a different dimension. And so whenever any animal in that world is about to die, they teleport <clears throat> that animal into the other dimension, and they ensure that that animal lives for as long as possible and has as many descents as it possibly have. Right? So therefore, in, in bizarro Earth, natural selection is totally neutralized. There's never any natural selection. Every creature has as many ancestors as it could possibly have. That means that if the evolutionary theory of intentionality is correct, those creatures in bizarre Earth have no intentionality. Their brains have no content, right? Because nature didn't select anything, right? But we're just like them. We're, we're exactly like them. We even have exactly the same history, except for the sort of bizarre things that happened to descendants of our ancestors here that didn't happen over there. 
right? So that, that I think, is a sort of reductio. It right? shows that there's something wrong with the, with the proposal. What it really shows, I think, is this, that intentionality is something that's intrinsic to us here and now. Right? Here I am, I'm thinking, the fact that I'm thinking that those thoughts have contents is intrinsic to me. It can't depend on what happened to descendants of my ancestors, you know, millions of years ago. That can't be what makes it the case now that I am, that I am thinking. Okay, sixth, um, the irreducibility of normativity. So normativity has to do with how things are supposed to be, how things would go if they went well. And uh, we can put it in terms of just, just, just descriptive and prescriptive. So descriptive describes how things are, prescriptive talks about how things ought to be. And the normative dimension includes two important cases I want to mention, moral norms and epistemic norms. Right? So the moral norms include also political norms, universal human rights, justice, that sort of thing. But epistemic norms include norms of reasoning and investigation. Right? So it's epistemic norms that distinguish good reasoning from fallacious reasoning, scientific conclusions from pseudoscience, uh, reasonable assumptions from crazy ones, plausible ex explanations from fantastic ones, and so on. So as in the case of intentionality, normativity poses a serious prima facie problem for materialism. Right? Mere physical facts, facts about the arrangement of matter, in and of themselves have no normative force. Moral and epistemic norms, in contrast, have nothing to do with mere quantity or with microphysical <coughs> particles or the behavior of blind forces. So there's a clear metaphysical gap between merely material phenomena and the normative dimension. So materialists have three options. They could deny there are any normative facts at all <coughs> and resort to some purely subjective anti-realism about norms. <clears throat> they can admit that norms exist at some fundamental level of reality that's distinct from the material world. That's really inconsistent with materialism, right? Or they can try and reduce the normative to the physical. Now, some will try to adopt the first, but uh, it seems to me that it forces you to deny certain plain facts, right? So for instance, it's just wrong to torture small kids for fun. Right? And if, if, if a philosophy tells us, well, no, that isn't true, right? There's something wrong with that philosophy, right? <laughs> Likewise, it's, it's unreasonable to believe something just because you've, you wish it to be true, right? Wishful thinking is unreasonable. And if materialism implies that that's false, so much the worse for materialism, right? There's gotta be something wrong somewhere. Uh, the second option would lead, again, away from materialism, so let's not worry about that. So again, the third question is, how can we reduce norms to, um, uh, to the physical? Um, well, one way we could do it, there's basically two ways to do it. Again, I'll, I'll simplify things a bit. Uh, we could try and reduce it to social conventions. So what makes something normative, either morally or epistemically, is just social agreement about it. Or we could appeal to, uh, again, evolutionary history. We could say that what makes something morally or epistemically right is that it worked for our ancestors and enabled them to reproduce themselves. Okay, well, in both these cases, I think there's going to be a problem. There, there, there are problems. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, let me skip over that. So, um, it's wrong to torture small children for fun, right? We're all down for that. Um, it would still be wrong even if our society adopted conventions that said that, said that it was right. I think that's pretty clear. And, and this version of materialism would have to reject that. And similarly, it would still be wrong even if our ancestors thrived when they tortured small children for fun, right? Uh, so if again we find another planet where creatures just like us had ancestors who, who thrived because they tortured small children for fun, <clears throat> that wouldn't make it morally right for them, nor would it make it morally right for us. Same thing for, uh, for wishful thinking. Wishful thinking is unreasonable. It would be unreasonable even if society decided it was reasonable. It would be unreasonable even if it were helped our, society, our ancestors to survive. Right? It, has a, it has an intrinsic wrongness to it, an unreasonableness to it that, again, materialism can't, can't really explain. Now, there are additional challenges beyond the six I mentioned. Um, I don't have three obvious reasons. I'm not going to go into them today. Um, now, some materialists think they have a trump card that can overwhelm all six of these challenges. And that's the imminent success of artificial intelligence and robotics, right? They say, look, once we've built an artificial person from purely material components, like silicon chips and wire, materialism will be established and everything else will be refuted. Now, I don't think it's at all obvious that we will succeed in doing that. Um, but even if we do, the relevance of that achievement will depend crucially on the knowledge that we bring to the task. So here we have to distinguish between two approaches to artificial intelligence classic artificial intelligence in the 1960s, 
Only computer science would call something classic in the 1960s, but that's, that's the way they talk about it. Classic AI and the neural net sort of picture of, ID, of AI. Now, in classic AI, the idea was we would really build a clockwork person, right? We would, uh, we would design a person whose every response was pre-programmed by someone using logic programming or something like that. Um, now, this, this, is almost complete, this is completely failed. It's run again and again into what's called the framing problem which is the problem of figuring out which among all the avalanche of data that's arriving is which bits of it are relevant and which bits are irrelevant. The logic machine just got churning away at all kinds of these, these conclusions and can't, can't come to a reasonable decision. So all the success we've achieved in AI, including Siri and language translators and Googles and all this sort of thing, has come about through neural nets, that is, by, by simply training a network that imitates the structure of the brain on, on experience. Now, uh, as uh, David Gordon has recently argued, the uh, Yale professor of uh, computer science, in his commentary uh, piece in, in January this year, um, again, this, this makes the, 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 the neural networks are basically black boxes. Even when they work, we don't know why they work. We don't understand how they're working. And so such, such success is philosophically ambiguous, since it could, it could always be interpreted one of two ways. We could suppose that we've shown that human thought and consciousness is really nothing more than atoms moving in the void. Or it could be that we've shown that the elements of the physical world have richer and more sophisticated capacities than materialism admitted. That is, there's inherent purpose and uh, meaning and so on at the material level, which is merely being expressed through the construction of the neural net. So in the end, that's inconclusive. Right? It could still be the case that the neural nets arrive with uh, Basically, we just found a new way of procreating ourselves, procreating things with irreducible, irreducibly conscious and intentional states. Okay, so what's next? What are some of the alternatives to materialism? Okay, let me uh, try to again summarize this real quickly. Uh, I think there are basically three possibilities. One would be some sort of dualism, in which you have, in addition to the material world, immaterial things, ghost, uh, egos or minds of some kind, this is the view of Plato, Augustine, Descartes, that sort of thing. We could suppose that, look, the whole physical world is really an illusion. So flip the, flip the uh, materialism on its head and go to the opposite extreme and say that the only thing that's real is the mental. And that would be some version of idealism. Or thirdly, we could admit that the natural world is undivided and real, but that the materialists have misdescribed it right, by looking at it in terms, of, in terms that are exclusively quantitative, bottom-up, and purposeless. But in fact, the natural world is largely top-down, holistic, purposeful, and qualitative as well. And that's the Aristotelian model. And that's the one that I actually uh, think is most likely to succeed. Although I think we can't really rule out the idealist one. Um, the dualist one, it seems to me, is the dark horse, the least likely of the three. Uh, and there's a couple reasons for that. One has to do with the thing I just mentioned, which is the progress we've had in artificial intelligence through neural nets. Is, is a real problem for the dualist. Because why should wiring up a neural net in a certain way and training it produce a new immaterial entity somewhere? So that, I think, is, is problematic. And also, it's, it's problematic for them to explain why brain damage of certain kinds affects high intellectual and mental capacities. Uh, if, 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 if the mental actions <coughs> are part of some separate entity, then that's difficult. But the, but the uh, Aristotelian, or the idealist for that matter, doesn't have any problem with either of those two. So it seems to me that those are both uh, viable options at some point. Okay, so let me conclude by talking about uh, some of the implications of all this for political theory and practice. Um, materialism is, I think, at the root both of modern liberalism and of Marxism. And in fact, both the right-wing or libertarian version of liberalism and the left-wing or egalitarian branch of it both have their origins in the materialism of the early modern period. Uh, materialism had two significant e effects on political theory. It led to the dominance of economic models, and it led to the conception of political theory as fundamentally a theory of <clears throat> conflict. Right? And again, I think you can see why if you look at the philosophy of Thomas Hobbes. So Thomas Hobbes is an English philosopher of the uh, 17th century, very explicitly a materialist in exactly the way I described. Uh, bottom-up, quantitative, uh, purposeless uh, motions of molecules. And he's the one that uh, introduces the idea of the, the state of nature as a state of conflict that has to be overcome by an artificial social contract that's imposed upon it. And, and, he, and he shows that, uh, I mean, the fundamental point here is that if you think that, uh, uh, that human beings are um, 
fundamentally material systems. And there's no reason to suppose that there's a natural harmony between human beings and society. Whereas Aristotelians have traditionally thought that there was, that there's a human essence, the very meaning or significance of being human is such that uh, human beings naturally form friendships mm -hmm. and naturally cooperate together in society. Materialists have no reason to believe that. And since Hobbes demonstrates that once you give up the confidence in natural harmony, you necessarily are forced to the opposite extreme and assuming that conflict is, is natural. Because as soon as I, I have to think that there's a possibility of conflict, then I need to prepare myself for that conflict by accumulating power and reputation and resources, which is a zero-sum game, right? The more I have, the less you have, which creates conflict. So if the mere possibility of conflict or the probability of conflict makes conflict necessary. And that's, that's really what lies at the foundation of all later uh, political philosophies. Um, Postmodernism, I think, is not the future. Postmodernism is really a version of hypermodernism. Postmodernism actually also depends on the materialist uh, philosophy of the early modern period. So I think that's also going to be passing. Um, the materialism Hobbes gave to modern political theory, all of its characteristic obsessions, individual liberty, equality, the absolute sovereignty of the state, the centrality of contract and law. And in, in contrast, the earlier non-materialistic philosophy of the feudal world revolved around a different set of ideas harmony, hierarchy, multiple centers of authority, local custom, and inherited status. So I actually expect the fall of materialism to result in a sort of feudalism, uh, more localism, more variation from place to place, more traditional and customary ideas, a more complex web of political and social institutions, with the unitary state replaced by a network of overlapping uh, institutions, production that's both less market-driven and less bureaucratic, more local, more sort of familial in nature, and an emphasis on small-scale, uh, sustainable technologies. And finally, just say uh, uh, to the conclusion that um, there is also, the, I mean, there are two possibilities here. One is this Aristotelian version, which I just mentioned, which would involve a sort of return to feudalism. The other approach would be the idealist alternative, which I think is also a possibility. And the most plausible version of idealism, I think, would be a sort of monistic idealism in which you think of the whole cosmos as sort of evolving towards some ultimate end. So Aristotelians assume that the world is made up of individual things, and those individual things belong to kinds which have a fixed nature. So Aristotelians are naturally backward-looking, sort of conservative, whereas monists think that the whole world is moving towards some ultimate end, right? And so they tend to be more progressive and um, more uh, forward-looking, and therefore uh, more open to some uh, these radical uh, transhumanist ideas that people have been floating about you know, turning us into computer programs or something like that, that actually might be attractive if you're an idealist, if you know the way for us to sort of evolve into a godlike state. But Aristotelians are going to be very suspicious about that, right? I think that that's, uh, I'm, I'm sort of with them. I mean, no thanks. <laughs> I could soon stay a human being rather than become a computer program of some kind. Okay, um, so although I've indulged in some prognostic prognosticating, uh, I definitely don't want to lay out any sort of timetable. So some of the changes I've described could happen the day after tomorrow, or they might take another 100 years or so. Um, materialism's had a long run, right? It's not gonna dissolve, I don't think it's gonna likely dissolve overnight, but I do think that uh, in the end, power is not gonna be able to resist the force of argument and evidence in the long run. All right, out there.